Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I extend the grace and peace to those at home as well. Sometimes we don't all see here that we usually have a handful of folks joining us from home. In fact, last week we had 15 people on Zoom along with us, and so we want to make sure folks at home know that they are connected with us and welcome also. I, uh, I have a special thing today, if you might have noticed, that Holly's aunt makes stoles, and this was my graduation present back in June, but you can't wear a stole in June, or a purple one. So, uh, so this is my Advent stole, and as we continue in the season of Advent, and purple, as we've said in the last couple of weeks, is a, in, in our liturgical year is a color for introspection and examination and, and special attention, and, and I was thinking about you know, there's a lot of things that we, in our normal life, do you ever feel like there's some important thing that you've been meaning to get to, but you haven't gotten to? Does anyone ever feel that way? <laughs> that card you're going to write, or that person you're going to give a phone call to, or that the thing that you've been meaning to do for so long? Well, I think Advent is, is a little bit of a season where we pause and attend to those important things, and to remind ourselves that God has entered the world and our hearts and our lives in a profound way, and how do we respond to that? Let's worship today in this season of Advent. We watch and wait for Christ's coming. We do with joy, remembering when God entered our world, trusting God's love and good purposes. We wait, but we also rejoice. We light again the candles of hope and peace. And this morning we add the candle of joy. Even in dark and difficult times, we rejoice in God's love and we hope in God's faithfulness, even to those who lived as exiles from their homeland of Israel. The Lord spoke through the prophet Zephaniah, saying, Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on, the, on a day of festival. In this season of Advent, we anticipate and seek to participate in God's fulfilled kingdom, but we do so in joy and confidence. Praise to be the Lord. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord is my strength and my might. God has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, Rejoice. Sing praises to the Lord, for God has done gloriously. Amen. Morning. Good morning. morning. I'll start with the poem today, <coughs> Missing the Boat by Naomi Shihab Nye. It is not so much that the boat passed and you failed to notice it. It is more like the boat stopping directly outside your bedroom window, 
The captain blowing the signal horn, the band playing a rousing march. The boat shouted, waving bright flags, its silver hull blinding in the sunlight. But you had this idea, you were going by train. You kept checking the timetable, digging for tracks, and the boat got tired of you. So tired, it pulled up the anchor and raised the ramp. The boat bobbed into the distance, shrinking like a toy, at which point you probably realized you had always loved the sea. And with that, let's bow our heads and have a prayer of illumination. Blessed God, we come to worship you today. Give us ears to hear your holy word, this wonderful gift that you have given us. As we listen, help us to open that gift and use it, especially during this season of Advent, as we wait your coming. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The first scripture is from Philippians chapter 3, verse, verses 3 through 11. And this is Paul talking, a letter from Paul. So we can imagine his life at that time. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then next is from Luke 3, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds <clears throat> that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these <clears throat> stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown <clears throat> into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. 
Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, well, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Hi, kids. Do you remember our story from last week? Zechariah and Elizabeth had been blessed with a baby in their old age. When he was born, everyone was surprised because his parents named him John, and because when Zechariah confirmed that that's what they wanted to name him, he could speak again after not having been able to for nine months. Zechariah sang a song to his new son that was also a prophecy, in which he said, And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. This baby grew up to be a man that today we call John the Baptist. John the Baptist grew up in the wilderness, and he wore very odd clothes made of camel hair and ate a lot of honey and locusts. At least, that's what the stories tell us. However, when John came out of the wilderness as an adult and started preaching, despite his being a little different, people flocked to hear his words and to be baptized. Our Bible story that Miss Diane read for us today tells us about one of the days that John was preaching at the Jordan River, and he was baptizing people there. John implored the people not only to be baptized, but also to change how they lived. When they asked him what he meant, he said, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. John was telling everyone to be kind to each other and to help one another. As John preached, the people began to wonder if John was the person that had been promised to the Israelites as the Messiah. But even as the people began to wonder this, John spoke up and said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to undo the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. During this time of Christmas, it's really easy to get caught up in the craziness of shopping and spending money and worrying about finding that perfect gift. But John tells us that we don't have to do that. We can look through our own toys and our own closets and share what we already have with those who have nothing. John also shared the good news with us that we already have the perfect gift. Jesus was born on Christmas, and he came to save us all. So rather than worry about what we don't have, we should focus on what we do have and what we can share. And we should always remember that because of Jesus, we already have the perfect gift, and we don't have to try and find it. All we have to do is open our hearts, share God's love through our words and our actions, and the gift is right there for us every day. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to us on Christmas. Thank you for sending John the Baptist before him to help pave the way in our hearts for the huge gift that Jesus gave us. Help us to open our hearts to Jesus this Christmas and remember John's words. Help us to share what we have and realize we each already have the perfect gift. Help us to accept the gift of Jesus' love and to share it with others. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I, I am pleased to announce this morning that I have come up with a tremendous fundraising venture. And I fully suspect Steve Bolter, Steve Bolter, our resident entrepreneur, will jump in on this. And here's the idea. 
It is a line of greeting cards featuring John the Baptist. Now, I'm thinking some of the messages inside could go like this. Merry Christmas, you brood of vipers. I mean, who would you not want to send that to? Or how about, may your holidays be full of repentance. Or here's my personal favorite. Drink your cocoa and remember the coming wrath. I think this is good. There's something real possibility here, I think. Well, as you can probably detect, this is just my dry sense of humor. I don't suspect we'll start a line of greeting cards unless Steve takes off with this and runs with it. But I think that John the Baptist's fervency tends to interrupt our Christmas feel sometimes. And what is more, I think John the Baptist probably mortified his mother on a number of occasions. John the Baptist is a pietist of sorts. And pietists are kind of a necessary annoyance. They want to know if your faith is real and true and personal. Their voice is advocating for fervency and sincerity and authenticity. Wikipedia defines pietism as a movement within Lutheranism in the 17th century that emphasizes biblical doctrine as long as the importance of individual piety and living a vigorous Christian life. No sitting back on your laurels. Pietists are critical of established religion and non-thinking rhythms and involvement in religious life. And so while the rest of us may like our comfortable rhythms, there is nothing that annoys a pietist more. And so John, of course, came along long before the term pietism was introduced. Prophetic was more the term of his day. Prophets calling for awakeness, <coughs> calling the king or the people back to what it means to live by God's law and as God's people, waking up one's listeners. And like the poem suggests this morning, we are sometimes slow to listen, slow to break from our assumptions and rhythms. And so, like an exasperated parent who is not being heard, John seems to ramp up his rhetoric. You brood of vipers, he says to his gathered congregation of sorts there on the banks of the Jordan. Can you imagine if I began a sermon that way? Would you guys like that? You brood of vipers, you venomous, dangerous beings. I don't imagine that would go too well, nor do I feel the need for it. But nonetheless, I, I could think of other venues or groups that I would happily begin a speech that way with. Anyone come to mind for you? I'll spare you my list, but I will say it's lengthy. But if you consider your own list, who would you begin a speech like that to? Perhaps if we think about that, maybe we can relate to John's fervency and frustration. He is calling those who claim to know God's promises, those who claim to be serious about what it means to be faithful. He's confronting them about their authenticity, confronting them about their mixed allegiances. They're going through the motions, and he's directing them back to God's instruction, back to God's hope for a coming kingdom. He calls them to turn and make ready to apply that fervency and that sincerity and that authenticity to the faith of their daily life. <clears throat> Bear fruits worthy of repentance, John says. Like the prophets of the biblical tradition and the pietists of the Reformed and Puritan tradition, John is intent on pointing out the oft inconsistency between religious practice and the fruits of one's life. So you can imagine how offended his listeners might be for people who've spent their life in the synagogue to be accused of being insincere or dangerous even. Larry Lahr was a pietist in my life. Larry introduced me to young life in my late teens. And I would see Larry sometimes, and he would always single me out to ask me questions like, what is God teaching you? 
or who are you reaching out to? And he didn't like generalizations. He wanted very specific, and it had to be very recent. Not who did you reach out to in the past, or how did God teach you in the past? You want to know what is the up-to-date information. Keith Green was a Christian musician who I listened to back in the season when I would see Larry Lahr, and he was famous for saying that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to Burger King makes you a hamburger. <laughs> now, I think ritual theorists would argue with him on that, but I think what Keith Green wanted to say was that being a Christian at its best is, is personal, and it calls for fervency and response and relationship with God in action, and one can sit <clears throat> in a church pew all they want doesn't necessarily bring the other. Like Keith Green, who said not to take pride in having your butt in the pew, John calls to his crowd to not trust in their genetics or their bloodline. Being that faith and ancestry were so closely tied in tr Jewish tradition, John says, don't begin to say to yourself that we have Abraham as our ancestor. It's not enough to map out your family tree. Don't rely on your bloodline or even your proximity to the land of Israel. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, John says. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In John's words, I hear a little play on the word tree, tree like the family tree, the heritage that you are attached to by virtue of your birth, the tree of Israel's lineage and inheritance, as well as the metaphorical tree that is supposed to bear fruit, representing our lives and a living faith. John is a little arresting in his directness. However, in his letter to the Philippians, Paul speaks similarly. He speaks similarly to a potential confidence in one's ancestry, of being of the right lineage. And Paul once viewed himself of importance for these reasons. And he goes on to list all the things he could put on his resume, all the points in which he could take pride. He lists the kind of things he has valued and has invested himself in, what he thought was the most important at the time. And I wonder, if you had to write your own list, what would you take pride in? What have you invested yourself in? What have you viewed as being most important along the way? I suspect much of what we would say would reflect perhaps the values of the church, but also culture and our place as Americans, our families of origins. And folks like Larry Lahr and Keith Green and John the Baptist and Paul would want to know more. They would press us. Bear fruit worthy of repentance, John would say. To those coming and going, John says, don't assume that you're ready for the kingdom of God. Don't assume you know what you're looking for. He would push us towards self-reflection and a deepening walk. But lest John be trapped in overly general claims and rants, we are told that people kept coming to him to be baptized in the Jordan. And they asked him a very practical question. What then should we do? And John, with the specificity of Larry Lahr, responds, well, if you have two coats, share with one who has none. And whoever has food, do likewise. And even the tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? And he said, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. And soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? And he said, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. John seems to be directing them to create change for themselves in whatever ways are possible, to work against what is culturally acceptable. Find ways within the constraints of your life to repent, to turn, to change directions, to make yourself ready and available 
so that you may bear the fruits worthy of God's people, worthy of a people that are making themselves ready for God's kingdom. Fruit worthy of repentance, a tree that bears fruit. And if John were with us, baptizing in the South Platte, if he could fit in between all the fishermen, and we were to go out to him and we asked such a question of him, what are we to do, John? What would he say to us? How would he direct us to create change for ourselves within the constraints of life and work, to push against the culturally acceptable, what might be the fruit we can bear to show ourselves worthy of a people who are repenting and turning and anticipating the kingdom of God? Within the constraints of our lives, the people who have our comings and goings rather mapped out, how can we create change for ourselves? within those interactions, to bring the sincerity and the fervency and the passion of our faith back into our daily rhythms and into the choices of our lives. Paul says that all the things that he took pride in in the past don't matter much to him anymore. He says they're loss or sometimes translated rubbish. He goes, He wants to know Christ instead. That has become his singular focus. To be caught in the movement of Christ's death and resurrection, of knowing Christ in all things. And in this season of Advent, it is a fitting time to consider what John might say to us and how we might make changes within the constraints of our lives to demonstrate a readiness and a willingness to participate and to proclaim a different way. God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And John's appeals come off a little caustic, making his insulting language a bit of a humorous pairing with seasonal greetings, thus our greeting card venture. But his language often takes on tones of judgment also. And he and other pietists and prophets can get a little overzealous at moments to the point where they take on a negative tone, a heaviness that turns others away, might make us want to go the other direction when we see him coming because he's too much for us. Like that exasperated parent who has taken on a dark tone, he means well, wishing for our best. And I think of the last line of Nye's poem where she writes that as the boat has been, that has been trying to get your attention bobs off into the distance, you probably realized you had always loved the sea. Suggesting that there is something in us that despite our resistance to change or our distractedness in daily life, really does want to follow that really does want a new direction, wants to press closer to knowing Christ, wants a new way for our hearts and our relationships. Therefore, I suggested that pietists are an annoyance, but a necessary one, because they try to awaken us to the very things we desire deep down. John wants us to be ready to grasp just how momentous it is when God visits the world. He wants us to be in awe when the one who comes, who is so high in rank that we ought not touch his sandals, and when that one so high in rank washes our feet and forgives our sins and shows us a love that transforms our ability to love, a love that awakens our hearts and hopes and desires. He would hate for us to miss how significant all this is. And I expect that we would not want to miss it either. And all God's people said. Would you stand with me as we sing our hymn? As we go this morning, let us go always in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.